Okay, this tutorial is about the voyages of Columbus and the Columbian Exchange. Now, when most people talk about the discovery of the New World, the name that comes to mind first is usually Christopher Columbus, as accurate or inaccurate as that may be. But there's increasing historical evidence to suggest that about 500 years before Columbus, the first guy to discover the New World was this guy, Leif Erikson, who some people say looked like this. But Leif Erikson was, after all, a Viking, so some statues suggest he looked like this. Either way, Erikson was among the last of a series of Viking voyages that started around 800 and would continue on for the next 200 years or so. Now, the initial voyages would make their way to an island in the North Atlantic that was very hospitable and good for settlement. And so the Vikings, trying to keep people from settling the region so they could have it for themselves, called it Iceland to throw people off the trail. A Viking named Eric the Red would eventually continue on to a much larger island full of ice and trying to trick people to settle there instead referred to it as Greenland. Now, Eric the Red's son, Leif Erikson, would eventually continue along this route until he eventually reached this region right here, today known as Newfoundland, literally translated as New Found Land. Now, that's what people call it today, but when Erikson first landed there in 1000 AD, he called it Vinland, because it abounded in wild grapes like a vineyard. The settlements in Newfoundland were flimsy and soon abandoned, which meant that there was very little recorded history about it. But nonetheless, remember the role of Leif Erikson in the discovery of the New World. Now, the reason I say that is because when we think of European exploration, we usually think of other Europeans. Restless people with ambitious governments behind them who wanted contact with the wider world, either for trade or for conquest. This started toward Asia and Africa, eventually, completely by accident, stumbling upon what we know as the New World today. The first region to really be explored by the Europeans was Asia. Clad in shining armor, thousands of Christian crusaders tried for 300 years to take the Holy Land in the Middle East away from the Muslims. That didn't work, but they did acquire a taste for the exotic delights of Asia. Goods that had been unknown in Europe, such as silk and perfumes and draperies, sugar, salt, and other spices, were now in very high demand. This, of course, made them extremely expensive. One, because they were in such high demand. Uh, this is the basic law of supply. The more people want something, the more people are going to charge for it. But more importantly, some of the expense came from the fact that these items were so difficult to supply in the first place. You have to remember that they were coming thousands of miles from places like Indonesia and China and India along this route right here in red, collectively known as the Great Silk Road, although it was more than just one road. These items were coming uh, along the road by camelback, in some case, they were coming by ship to various ports to get on the Great Silk Road and eventually making their way to Europe to be sold there. Now, uh, this was not an easy task. Obviously, the weather and the terrain made it difficult, but there were also numerous Muslim, quote-unquote, middlemen along the way. Now, these were people who were going to get a cut of your profits, much like the Mafia, if you didn't pay them, they'd refuse to let the goods continue on, either by just stealing them and killing you, or robbing you and leaving you be. So you had to pay them. By the time the goods reached Italy, the overhead costs of buying and transporting these goods made profits minimal for European distributors. They simply couldn't charge enough to make it worth their while for what they had to pay just to get the stuff there. So they became pretty desperate for an alternate method of getting goods from Indonesia, China, and India to Europe. And the possibility arose of maybe going west and trying something around the southern tip of Africa. Now, what gave Europeans this idea in the first place? Well, it goes back to 1295 and this guy, Marco Polo, who returned after 20 years in Asia, claiming to have been in China the whole time. Now, the historical evidence on that is really sketchy, even suggesting that he didn't do it at all. But nonetheless, his stories motivated Europeans to set out for Asia themselves. The problem, though, is that most European sailors had refused to sail down Africa's west coast because it was too hard to get back. Northerly winds driving the current south were great for leaving Europe, 
but it meant you had to come back going directly into those winds, which made it vir virtually impossible for getting home. So, around 1450, the Portuguese solved this problem in two ways. The first solution was the caravel, which you see before you in the picture here. The caravel was a ship that could sail into the wind much more effectively than prior ship designs, which meant it was possible to get up the west coast of Africa on a return trip. Secondly, the Portuguese discovered that if they could hug the west coast of Africa on any return trip and eventually turn northwest toward the Azores, they would find prevailing west winds coming up to effectively carry them back home. This also provided another added benefit. The northern shore of Africa's Sahara Desert had been known to Europe since the days of the Greeks and the Romans. They'd never been able to cross into the sub-Saharan region before, the region south of the Sahara Desert, because the Sahara Desert is pretty formidable. It's difficult to walk across or even trek across with a camel. But now if they had this sailing technology and this knowledge of prevailing winds, they could get down here to the gold of sub-Saharan Africa. And they could also get to places like Timbuktu, which was a major trading center. As a result of these innovations, the Portuguese promptly set up trading posts all along the West African shores for the purchase of gold and also slaves. Now, this had been happening between African slave traders and the Arabs for centuries before the Europeans got involved. But this is where the Europeans adopted, for the first time ever, the practices of slave trading. And they eventually became the biggest practitioners of it in the world. The Portuguese would build their own slave trade to work on new sugar plantations that they, and later Spain, established on, established on African coastal islands. This meant about 40,000 slaves between the years 1450 and 1500 working on Portuguese and Spanish plantations. But despite the innovations of the Portuguese, they still had one goal that was unrealized, and that was rounding the southern tip of Africa. That situation would eventually change because of this guy, Bartolomeu Diaz. Diaz made it around the southern tip of Africa in 1488, and it was no small accomplishment. This tip is generally known as the Cape of Good Hope, but Diaz had referred to it as the Cape of Storms back then because of the cold water and warm water currents that made it such difficult sailing. Eventually, it was renamed to a more positive name, the Cape of Good Hope, in the hope of the prosperity that a sea route around Africa to the east would bring to the Europeans. But even with that accomplishment, Diaz's route went right here and basically stopped. He never actually made it to India. That was pulled off in 1498 by a guy named Vasco da Gama. Da Gama had gone way out into the Atlantic, eventually made his way around the Cape of Good Hope with various stops along the way, and finally did reach India again in 1498. Da Gama's accomplishment, which happened about six years after Columbus thought he had discovered India, made him a hero in Europe. Okay, now that we have that all settled, it brings us to the man of the hour in this tutorial, Christopher Columbus. And the first question we have to ask is, how did Columbus eventually become so famous in the first place? Well, that actually starts in Spain with the marriage of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, who had united their kingdoms and therefore given Spain a new unexpected strength. And with that new strength, they wanted what Portugal was already getting, and more. Ferdinand and Isabella were looking for a westward route to Asia that would not go around Africa, because the Portuguese controlled that route already. So they selected not a Spaniard, but an Italian, Christopher Columbus, to lead the expedition west. Now, you can say what you want to about Columbus, but i got to give him a lot of credit here. At that time, people had earnest, and earnest beliefs that the world might actually be flat. And they also believed that if you sailed west, you might actually sail off the edge of it. It takes a certain amount of bravery to say, yeah, I might go off the edge of the world, sign me up. And you got to give Columbus credit for that. But nonetheless, there are certain myths about Columbus that have been propagated in elementary schools across the country, although I think ours does a, a better job with that than most. The first one is that he discovered what the United States calls America. 
That's not true. What we call America, the, what the land is that is currently the United States of America, Columbus never even went near. Now, if you're talking about the New World, well, now you got a point. But in terms of Columbus discovering America, not so much. Maybe the Americas. The second myth is that he had a great relationship with the native peoples that he stumbled across when he discovered the New World. He referred to them as Indians because he thought he was in India. I have no idea how long it took Columbus to figure out that he wasn't in India, but the name still sticks with us today. There is also this notion that he was friendly with the Native Americans, much like the pilgrims from years later, but that wasn't the case either. He subjugated the Native peoples that he came across, and they grew to hate him. The third myth was that Columbus was a great leader. Uh, he eventually became the governor of Hispaniola, which is where he landed first, but uh, he did not do a very good job running the place. And the last thing that people assume about Columbus that's uh, a straight-out myth is that he gained great wealth. That's not true either. Uh, he wasn't very good with his money, and he died basically penniless. So, overall, history has given us some reasons to be somewhat divided on our views of Christopher Columbus. Even still, it seems that Columbus is an American icon who we celebrate with almost religious fervor. Things like parades on Columbus Day, naming cities after him like Columbus, Ohio, or places like Columbia University, or the Columbia River in Washington, or the Space Shuttle Columbia, or other cities like Columbia, Missouri, or Columbia, South Carolina. Or the Columbia Broadcasting System, also known as CBS. And finally, let's not forget our national capital, Washington, D.C., technically known as Washington, District of Columbia. Now, even though Columbus is a controversial figure in terms of how history chooses to remember him, we still have to give him credit, a lot of credit, for the four voyages that he took to the New World, starting with the first one in 1492, uh, an expedition that included the ships the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. That first voyage in 1492, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, would take him to what we now refer to as Cuba. Back then, though, Columbus called it Hispaniola, and this is where we get the term Hispanic from. A second voyage in 1493 would take Columbus past the Dominican Republic, as we call it today, Haiti, and all the way to Jamaica. A third voyage in 1498, the same year that da Gama reached India, would take Columbus past Trinidad and Tobago and other regions of the Caribbean. And a final voyage in 1502 would take Columbus all the way to the Central American coastline, and exploring various parts of the Caribbean Sea. So, it's not like Columbus did nothing. As a matter of fact, the next 300 years or so of contact between Old World Europeans and New World Native Americans would be named after Columbus. It was called the Columbian Exchange, also known among historians as the Contact Period. And a lot of good stuff came from Europe to the New World, including wheat, sugar, rice, coffee, horses cows, and pigs, all introduced for the first time from Europe. The New World also gave Europe some various things that were good as well, including gold, silver, corn, potatoes, tomatoes, tobacco, beans, vanilla, and chocolate, among other things. But not everything was good. From Europe came a series of diseases that Native Americans had no immunity for and would see their, dec their populations decimated because of it. These included smallpox, yellow fever, malaria, measles, flu, typhus, diphtheria, and scarlet fever. These destroyed populations. Uh, the Taino tribe in Hispaniola, uh, their population dropped from 1 million down to 200 in just 50 years because of the diseases. And from 1492 to the present, the native population has dropped by 90%. We even got dandelions from Europe. We'd never had those before, so when they pop up in the yard, blame them. But the New World got its revenge a little bit, giving the Old World syphilis. That's it. Thanks for listening.